Uh, and first up, we're going to be doing um, all things X-Men biology. That covers a lot of ground. Uh, the X-Men are probably tied to a scientific concept more than just about any other property in comics, and um, specifically uh, biology, but evolution. And uh, we are lucky enough to have an evolutionary biologist to uh, try to explain how X-Men mutation might actually work. And uh, that's uh, Dr. Nathan H. Lentz. So we're going to see him try to pack, oh, I don't know, 80 years of continuity into 20 minutes. Uh, Mitchell, hit the button. Hello, it's my pleasure to be here today to talk about the biology of the X-Men. My name is Nathan Lentz, and I'm a professor of biology at John Jay College at the City University of New York. And among other things, my research interest is in the evolution of the human genome and how genes become born, how genes get activated, how genes do what they do uh, in the human body over evolutionary time. Whether or not that qualifies me to uh, dissect and pick apart the X-Men, I'm not so sure, uh, but I was invited to do so. Uh, and it was with great pleasure that I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, mutants and mutations. Uh, and my goal is not to ruin anyone's fun or to, to pick apart the X-Men or debunk anything, but rather to come up with um, interesting ways in which the X-Men possibly could work, uh, the molecular mechanisms underneath the X-Men, if you, if you will. Uh, and to also under understand how the X-Men and comics in general interact with real scientific principles. Um, as a sci-fi fan, I've always believed that science fiction is one of our um, sort of best tricks uh, as a culture in order to get the public excited about science. Um, because a lot of what happens in science fiction later becomes real uh, in terms of science, and it inspires scientists uh, to do our work. Uh, many of us uh, adult scientists were once young adult uh, science fiction enthusiasts who, of course, grow up into adult uh, science fiction enthusiasts. And so I love to talk about the science of how science fiction might actually work. And so with that in mind, let's let's take a look at the X-Men and try to understand their underlying biology. I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully this works. So despite my enthusiasm for science, I'm actually not usually that great at technology. Um, but anyway, here we go. I'm now uh, sharing my screen, I believe. And go ahead and put that on full screen if it works. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. We'll talk about the biology of the X-Men and specifically about the mutants. Now, um, I want to uh, begin this show uh, by, look, by looking at what some of the mutants really are. And so um, in, in biology, a mutant is an, is an organism, an individual uh, that has suffered a recent mutation that gave it some sort of phenotype. And the word phenotype just me merely means the physical expression of that mutation. So right off the bat, we have a problem in discussing the, the mutants as such from X-Men, because it's very clear that a single mutation could never give rise to all of the complex phenotypes that we see in the X-Men, whether it's from Beast or Wolverine um, and, and, and any of the winged creatures. So let's talk about, you know, Angel or, or any of those that, that have um, wings. To, to get wings to grow out of the human body, out of the back of the human body, um, you would require a whole number of mutations. A lot of genetic changes would be responsible for creating that new tissue. You, you, have, you have bones involved. You have muscles involved. You have nerves involved. Uh, all kinds of soft tissue, connective tissue. And then, of course, you need rewiring of the brain to work those wings. There's just simply, that's just way too much work for a single mutation uh, to do. Uh, and, and you could map this onto every single X-Men mutant that we have. Um, their specialness, their uniqueness, their powers um, could not possibly be the result of a single mutation. So to call them a mutant in regard to the mutant phenotype that we see among the X-Men, it, it, it's just way too much. So our, our, our um, word choices there uh, might not be perfectly appropriate. However, let's look at what kind of mutations might actually get uh, to the point of having wings growing out of our back and so on and so forth. Let's discuss what mutations are and how they could give rise to the mutants that we know of as the X-Men. So first of all, a mutation, the most interesting thing that we have to remember about mutations is that mutations are accidents. They are either copying errors or other kinds of damage that happens to DNA um, that disrupts the, the uh, normal or, or pre-existing uh, DNA sequence. So most often this, this comes about as the result of a copying error. So you have simply an original DNA template and then a, a copy that's made, and you might accidentally add the wrong base pair of DNA. So where you should have added an A, you add a T, uh, and this becomes a permanent 
uh, change in the DNA sequence. If this is heritable, meaning it gets passed on through the germline or egg cells and sperm cells, if it is that, then it might uh, become fixed in the population. Um, these mistakes are largely random. They're not directed by any process. Uh, they're unguided. They just sort of pop up whenever they pop up. And right away, you can see uh, it would be almost impossible to make a million of these in such a specific way to grow wings out out of your back. Uh, mutations can be in the form of deletions, they can be in the form of insertions, they can be uh, base pair substitutions, as you see up here. Um, and I, even though these are mistakes, these are accidents, these are unguided, they are also the sole engine of innovation. Uh, of any species. Everything we know in life that is creative and new and different uh, than what came before it started as an accident. It started as a mutation. And that gave rise to everything from our fingers to our eyes to just the mere fact that we are uh, more than just one cell. All of that was a result of these unguided mutations. So they are capable of creating these great uh, complex phenotypes, but you need a lot of them. Uh, and in the case of the X-Men, it seems like we're getting a lot of them all at once. So let's, let's revisit that. First of all, one specific kind of mutation that, that can occur uh, is not just a single base pair change, but a copying uh, of an entire stretch of DNA into multiple copies. All right, and this is sometimes called gene duplication, and it's an incredibly important process in evolutionary history. So if you have these chromosomes here, uh, you can delete parts of a chromosome, but you can also duplicate parts of the chromosome. And this is often uh, the engine of creativity and innovation, because once you have two copies of something, you can uh, sort of monkey around with one of the copies while the original copy does whatever it was supposed to do uh, in the body. So you don't lose any function by tinkering around with the extra copy. Um, and these generally can come about any number of ways, but what we've shown here in these cartoons are chromosomal breaks and repairs and other kind of large scale uh, mutations. Um, a lot of mutations that occur, however, are neutral at the time that they happen. So not all mutations really have any big effect on the, on the body. Uh, and this would be true for, for anyone over time that you just sort of accumulate some of these and if they're neutral, they don't make any difference and they just sort of get added to the gene pool. Um, and what happens is you could accumulate these, many of these over millions of years, uh, is what we call cryptic variation. So all of this variation that we can have from person to person, much of it actually doesn't do anything at any one point in time. However, it contributes to this silent reservoir of genetic diversity that could be tapped into later. And you might even kind of see where I'm going with this. Um, and so if you can imagine over millions of years of time, the human race uh, th uh, and, and through some interventions that we'll talk about in a second, uh, we might have ha actually had a lot of various mutations that could be activated later. So for example, uh, growing wings out of our backs or, or, or different other abilities that we might gain uh, in the X-Men lore um, could have come about by variations that were present, in, in fact, pre possibly present in many of us that then get activated later. And this brings us to the X gene. The X gene uh, is the most famous of all the sort of mutant uh, mechanisms that we talk about within the X-Men, but it's a single gene. And we know it's a single gene uh, because of the way it's been talked about um, in, in the comics. However, it might very well be a master regulator. So this is a, a concept that I wanna introduce you to called the master regulator, which is a gene that activates other genes. And these are common throughout biology. Uh, this is especially true during development, which would be a key thing during, uh, during the generation of mutant phenotypes. Um, but a master gene is one that turns on lots of other ones. So you can have a gene that, for example, turns an undifferentiated cell into a muscle cell or into a neuron. Obviously one gene or one protein can't do all that work, but if it's a master gene, it is then initiates a cascade of events, turning on hundreds, even thousands of other genes, which express other proteins, which then go and do the job of turning that cell into a muscle cell or whatever. Um, and these master genes, these master regulators can have vast, vast effects throughout the body and, in, and completely change the, the sort of trajectory of a certain cell. And its destiny, its fate uh, can be determined by a single gene. And these are very powerful. And there's many examples of these in human biology. So if we think of the X gene as a master regulator that could have been activated any number of ways, but then what it does is then act on all that cryptic variation that I talked about before. Over the course of millions of years, we could have been accumulating all kinds of mutations throughout our genome that were dormant. These were latent mutations ready to be activated by the master regulator we know of as the X gene. So that's 
sort of my hypothesis on how this might actually work. And there's some evidence from the literature. So if we want to use the scriptures as our guiding force here, um, in House of M number one, Dr. Henry McCoy talked about the X gene was not one strand of DNA, but millions strung together. Uh, and it would be a combination so complex that it wouldn't be figured out in his lifetime. Of course it wouldn't. As we know, Dr. Henry McCoy uh, was a mutant known as Beast. Uh, who had all kinds of uh, phenotypic changes all throughout his body. And so if anybody would know the, the incredible nature of these X genes, it would be him. But interestingly, um, his word choice might seem a little funny, but he's actually sounds like he's describing a master regulator that goes and turns on millions of things throughout the genome. So the X gene might truly be a single gene capable of huge effects in the body, not on its own, but through its activation of cryptic variation that could, could have accumulated over geologic time. And to give you a real life example of how this could work, this is a true mutant. This is a fruit fly. So uh, the genus Drosophila, you may have heard of a very common laboratory animal used to discover things in genetics. With a single mutation, you see this, this nice little structure here uh, called the antenna. With a single mutation, scientists were able to turn that antenna in, in this mutant into a leg. This is a fully formed leg on the head of a fruit fly. Um, and and <clears throat> because all of the genes necessary to build a leg were obviously there because the, the fly has other legs, um, but to get those operated in this place at this time took only one switch. So all of these genes suddenly switched from building an antenna to building a leg because all of that genetic material, that genetic information was already there in the cell. So when the right mutation came along and it activated and it changed the fate of those cells. Right, so this is a real life example of a master regulator at work. In this case, it's doing the wrong thing in the wrong place but it has the ability. So if we assume that the X-Men phenotype, the genetic material is already there laying dormant in the genome and the X gene merely activates it, well then now we have a mechanism. And keep in mind that the cryptic variation that's out there in the population will be different from person to person. Each one of us will have a different combination of mutations and cryptic variation. And once you have that, once you have the um, that cryptic variation, um, and each one of us, it would be activated differently by the, um, by the X gene. Okay, and just, just another real life example. So we have a fruit fly here again, here's his head. Um, this unfortunate guy has lots of developmental problems, but among other things that, that are going on with him, you can see all of these little eyeballs, uh, not eyeballs, they have a compound eye, but all of these eye structures that are forming throughout the body. So these cells here that should have been a leg um, the right, the, the, the genes for legness were, were turned off and the genes for uh, forming an eye structure were turned on. And so you have this eye tissue forming right on the leg. So that just goes to show that dormant genetic material can be activated under the right circumstances. And this fly is a mutant. It has one specific change. So now we're back to understanding the X-Men as mutants. They have a single gene, the X gene, that activates dormant genetic changes that, have, that were already there, that were already pre-existing, even in their own parents, whether or not their parents were mutants themselves. Okay, so this, now where did all this come from though? Where did the genetic material, this cryptic variation that the X genes act on come from? Well, we actually have some clues about that as well. And to do that, we have to explore what I call mutant paleoanthropology. Paleoanthropology is the study of the human species um, evolving, uh, to, to, to put it to put it uh, to put a fine point on it. Uh, so let's talk about how the mutants uh, evolved. Well, we know from Uncanny X-Men uh, number 141 um, that there are three classes of humans, and, and we, get, uh, we get quite specific here. We have the regular old unaltered Homo sapiens, and that's class H, and then we have class M, which were the mutants, Homo superior, which we are all familiar with as the mutants, the X-Men mutants, but we also have class A, which are the anomalous humans that have the genetic potential to become mutants. So this idea of cryptic variation spread out through the population that can be activated later, that's already out there in the X-Men canon. Um, so, um, so this hypothesis that I've come up with is based on, on canon, not just my, my science uh, fiction uh, <coughs> in, my, in my own brain. Uh, and we know from um, uh, the uh, Uncanny X-Men annual number 13 that about a million years ago, uh, there was some deliberate attempts to modify the human genome in this way. And that's where we get the deviants or homo descendus as they were called. So the deviants were made through gen direct genetic manipulation. And keep in mind that that genetic manipulation would then add to the gene pool. 
And a million years ago is a long time, lots of generations for that variation to continue mutating and spreading it throughout the population in infinite diverse combinations. Um, and, and, and that was not the only attempt at manipulation. As we know, uh, Nazar the Calculator manipulated uh, uh, humans as well to create the Eternals or Homo Immortalis. And we have these uh, uh, genetic variants uh, on which that are spreading through the population. And if you can imagine this, these alterations as silently working their way through the population over millions of years or a million years, um, we, we can also explain the sporadic appearance of mutants as we see in X-Men canon uh, throughout that time. There were sporadic appearances, and those were what we would call spontaneous mutants uh, that either activated an X gene or somehow other activated parts of that genetic cryptic variation. Um, and, and that's in line with what we know how biology works with sporadic uh, random mutation. <clears throat> Adding to this, we also have the proto-mutants, right? The Atlanteans and the Inhumans uh, in Homo supremus and Homo mermanus that get added into this, this gene pool as well. And so if you can imagine a million years of evolutionary history, and I love this image created by uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Robert DeSau from the, the Natural History Museum uh, here in New York. Um, you can imagine through the earliest species of human ancestors, if you add in the X-Men, those were who deliver, excuse me, the X-Men mutants that, that we know of um, as adding into um, the, the evolutionary history of our species, that's a lot of genetic variation and a lot of time for it to diversify and spread throughout the population. Okay, so we talked about mutants and, and regular mortal humans, uh, you know, regular humans. Uh, we also have hybrids and the idea that you can make the two and create uh, a new versions of mutants. And so this, this gets into the genetics of the X gene. Well, first of all, it does appear to be dominant. So, and when we talk, when we talk about genes, we have to understand dominance versus recessiveness. A recessive gene is something you need two copies of, whereas a dominant gene, you only need one. So it appears that most hybrids between humans and mutants generally tend to be mutants. So we, so we tend to think of this as a dominant gene, but not always. And of course we have uh, examples of those that are not. Uh, and, and actually I think there's one on the slide here in a second. Um, but generally, what, if, you, if you had two mutants that were both uh, copy, carriers of the X gene, assuming they only had one copy of the X gene and then on their other chromosome it was not, uh, then three fourths of their offspring would be mutant, but one out of every four offspring would not, would not get it just by the basic laws of Mendelian inheritance. And this is my colleague, Elena Bern, uh, uh, Bernanskaya uh, at NYU who created this, this figure. Uh, anyway, the point here is that the uh, Mendelian genetics, sort of classical genetics of the way that genes are inherited and alleles of genes are inherited would actually predict exactly what we see in X-Men inheritance, how you don't always get um, the uh, offspring looking like the parents in the inheritance of the X gene. And of course, Graydon Green, as we know, was the son of two mutants. Um, and uh, Graydon Green was, uh, excuse me, Graydon Creed uh, was the son, I believe, of Mystique and Sabretooth, both mutants. And he himself was a normal human. So he just got to be the unlucky who did not get the X gene. Importantly, he would have the same cryptic variation that presumably we all have, but without the X gene, it was not activated. So he could have been a cool combination of the, of the mutants, of the mutations that his parents had, but instead he was none of that. And, and as we know, he became very um, resentful of that. Um, it does appear in some lineages to, to work on the X chromosome, but not always. And so how can it sometimes be dominant, but not always be dominant? How can it be on the X chromosome and then not on the X chromosome? Well, it's important to remember that genes, the X gene would be like any other gene, are dynamic, especially over the fullness of evolutionary time. Um, and so genes sometimes get inactivated either through mutation or what we call epigenetics. Epigenetics is a, it can be used as a silencing of genes. Separate from the sequence itself, they can actually be silenced through chemical modifications. Genes can also move around. So we have these, these phenomena sometimes called jumping genes of transposable elements. These are real genetic phenomena where genes can move around from one chromosome to the next through the generations. So this could explain why in some lineages it appears on the X chromosome, but other times it clearly does not. Okay, so that's sort of a, a theory that we could have of how this might all work in the molecular mechanisms. I now want to discuss a couple of other phenomena that the X-Men touch on that have real biological principles at work. Um, and some of them might, I, I might get a little um, cranky about and other ones I'm really excited about. So the first one, I just have to do this. I'm sorry, I know he's a favorite X-Men and I like him too, but Darwin, while one of the most interesting and, and, and wonderful X-Men for his ability to adapt 
to all kinds of changing environment, he has a very unfortunate name because the adaptation that we see in the X-Men Darwin is not at all the adaptation that Charles Darwin was talking about and that taught us about. Um, first of all, individuals, according to biological adaptations, individuals don't adapt. That's not adaptation. That's not what the word adaptation means in a biological context. Um, populations adapt over time through the differential success of individuals. Uh, and the way that actually works, like, like for example, Darwin, the X-Men, you know, you put him in a dark room and all of a sudden he develops uh, night vision. Uh, that's not how biological adaptation works. And in fact, he actually tried to uh, kill himself one time by throwing himself out a window and he adapted to become so light Actually, it wouldn't be light. It would be he would be less dense. Um, he he became so so less dense that he he floated uh, harmlessly to the ground. So that kind of adaptation is not Darwinian adaptation. What Charles Darwin was talking about is the variation that we see uh, in a population, and then the application of some selective pressure uh, that leads to differential survival. And that's what adaptation is in the world of biology, where some individuals uh, survive and some don't. And the, the history of the species is thus changed by the differential success of some members versus others. So Darwin himself cannot evolve, cannot adapt. Um, he, can, he can respond, and that's called biological responsiveness. And, and we have homeostasis and other uh, real phenomena that could be at play there. But he, he just shouldn't have gotten the name Darwin. That, that's the only thing I have to get a little uh, cranky about. Uh, another thing that was really interesting we saw during the teasers for the House of X, uh, it, now, now we're into the cinematic universe, but when two aggressive species share the same environment, evolution demands adaptation or dominance. And this was based on a very real biological principle called the competitive exclusion principle. And what this tells us is that two species cannot occupy the same niche. And what a niche is, is it's more than just a habitat. It's more than just a physical location. It's also what it eats and what it does and how it lives. And it's true when two species come in direct competition, eating the same food in the same place, one or the other has to give because even a slight advantage of one over the other leads to complete extinction of the weaker one. And so when you have that head-to-head uh, -head competition, generally what happens in biology is what we call resource partitioning. Uh, so in order to avoid extinction, one creature or the other will so simply go a different way. They'll climb higher up in the tree or eat a different kinds of food to, in order to avoid that kind of head-to-head -head competition that is uh, so, so much leads to extinction. So if we think of the humans and mutants as different species, uh, rather than going head-to-head, -head, it would be best if they sort of find their way around each other to avoid that kind of competition. Now, this leads to the concept of speciation. Are humans and mutants separate species? Are they distinct species? Well, now we need to think about how speciation actually occurs. So in, in biology, speciation happens when a parent population splits into two groups that are no longer the same gene pool. So you don't have active interbreeding. Uh, and so then they can go off in their own separate, uh, their own separate fates, their own separate destiny. And when this happens, uh, actually, let me, let me show you a very famous example of this. So you have two species of chimpanzees, the, the, the most famous one, the common chimpanzee, um, which is shown here. Um, in this slide, but you also have the bonobo, or sometimes called the pygmy chimpanzee, which is very similar, but they are distinct, and there's, they don't actively interbreed. They are two different species of chimpanzees. They both evolved in Africa. Now, the trick to understanding how speciation actually works is, is to understand that they have to be separated from one another geographically in order to, so that they, so, so it's not that they don't interbreed, it's that they can't interbreed for a while, and then they become so different that they won't interbreed if they come back uh, into contact. So how did this happen with chimpanzees? They all live in Africa. How did you get different populations? Well, if you look at where bonobos live, that's colored in red here, they do not have an overlapping territory with the other species of chimpanzee, which is spread across multiple uh, regions of Africa. And the reason why is this right here is the Congo River and chimpanzees cannot swim. So the Congo River completely separated uh, this group of chimpanzees. And so that in a, less than a million years, they evolved into their own species. They are not inter interchangeable with the other species, with the main species of chimpanzees. So you got this kind of subspecies that grew into its own species in its own right. What does this have to do with the X-Men? Uh, if geographic isolation is what is required for reproductive isolation, what does this have to do with the X-Men? Well, you have, all of these 
uh, examples throughout evolutionary history of didn't different kinds of mutants that have been created and their genetic, but we know that their genetic diversity was added in to the gene pool of the human race, of the human species. This was not a speciation event. Uh, even though in X-Men lore, we talk about homo descendants, homo immortalis, and even homo superior, homo superior, the, the, the main X-Men that we're talking about, these were not distinct species. They cannot be distinct species because we know that there's so much interbreeding with regular humans. And we also know, it, according to my theories anyway, about the cryptic variation that then gets activated by the X gene. This is not a speciation event. Yes, they are very different phenotypically. They have different characteristics, but that does not make them a different species. They're just a variant of the main species of Homo sapiens. However, however, if we look at the island of Krakoa, where hundreds and hundreds of X-Men now live, the mutants live, and are creating their own environment there, uh, where they're safe from the interaction with humans, if they're there long enough, they will achieve speciation because, as experiments have shown in the laboratory, the mere fact of interbreeding separately for long enough does lead to reproductive isolation. A very classic experiment was done with fruit flies, where they took just one batch of fruit flies, split them into two, and the only and they kept them separate. The only thing different was they fed them different food. And after 30 or 40 generations, their ability to interbreed was weakened. And the longer you do it, the weaker the interbreeding becomes until they are completely separate species. And so if you look at, at, at Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens, so we're talking about Neanderthals and modern humans, how did they become different? Well, Neanderthals evolved in Eurasia, in Europe and Central Asia. And Homo sapiens, our, our ancestors stayed in Africa. So you have an African species and a Eurasian species that were separated long enough that they took on different destinies and different fates. Now, we also know that some human populations have some Neanderthal DNA. So there was what we call introgression. There was some interbreeding. But importantly, the gene pools did not merge back into one, so they are distinct species. So in the island of Krakoa, if the X-Men are there long enough, they could achieve reproductive isolation, and that would be a species level event, a speciation event, excuse me. So are the, are the X-Men the next step in human evolution? Well, by definition, no, because if they evolve separately from us, they would not be the next step in our evolution. They would be their evolution. They would be an offshoot of modern humans. So unless any of you are X-Men, uh, you won't be participating in that. Because if uh, instead the X gene spreads through our population, then we wouldn't have homo sapiens anymore. We would all be homo superior. Um, so it, it's an interesting way to think about it. But one thing to remember um, is that the key to evolution is what we call fitness. And fitness does not have to do with how powerful you are, how strong you are, how good your body works. Fitness has to do solely and only with reproductive success. You are fit if you leave a lot of successful offspring. And we also know from this that the X-Men as a group are not actually that fit. Most of them, many of them, uh, leave no offering whatsoever. For various reasons, they have personality disorders and, and are just kind of antisocial. Um, and they don't do a lot of breeding or at least a lot of interbreeding with humans. Um, there are some exceptions. There are, there's plenty of hanky-panky going on. And we also know uh, like Magneto and Wolverine have tons and tons of offsprings, although there's alternate timelines there going on. Um, but the main thing is that as a group, the X-Men are not particularly reproductively fit. So they're not leaving a ton of offspring. And because of that, uh, the human population might, might very well never be overtaken. So the X gene might not really spread through the population unless they somehow get to be more prolific uh, with their reproduction because fitness is the end readout of, of, of the genetics of evolution. You have to leave a lot of successful offspring in order for your genes to be carried over at a greater percentage in the next generation. Um, so the gene pool is only really affected by those who leave offspring. Uh, and most, if not, if not many, uh, of the X-Men don't leave a lot of offspring. Anyway, th that's sort of my ideas of th sort of how the biology of the X-Men work and how X-Men uh, lore interacts with real biology. And I hope you've enjoyed this talk. And in any one of these uh, bits and pieces of this talk can be spread out into a whole article and whole presentation in, in and of itself. Uh, I tried to sprinkle in a couple of examples, but for interest of time, I just had to, had to breeze through. But I want to thank Russ, Dob uh, Russ Dobler uh, for the invitation to, to speak with you today. He's, he's been a friend of mine for a few years, and um, um, I look forward to, to uh, any questions that you have for me. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I'll tell you what, man, you, I'm going to unmute you here in a sec. Uh, you shut my mouth. I said 
That looks awfully ambitious. Um, are you sure you can get through all that? Um, you went a little over, 30 minutes, but you know what? It's online. We're all home, so who cares? Nathan, you there? I am here. Turn your video on. Um, yeah, so thanks for doing that. Um, I would say a Herculean effort, but uh, Hercules, of course, not a mutant, so... Well, um, thank you very much. It was um, pieced together from a lot of work that's already there on AIPT. So I was really just kind of presenting. Besides the cryptic variation bit, most of it uh, I pieced together from articles that you're already hosting on your website. Yeah, and I'm actually going to post. We have a we have a link of um, you know this. A lot of this can, came from uh, back in November of 2018. Uh, Marvel relaunched the flagship Uncanny X Men book, and um, one of our huge X-Men fans on the site on AIPT wanted to um, do a big thing about it. Uh, so uh, I said, well, I'll try to find some science people to do some stuff. And you came through with some great articles. Yelena Ber Bernatskaya came through with some great articles, Rob DeSalle. So I just put that link in there of all of the um, X-Men biology stuff we did. Um, sadly, Yelena and uh, Rob couldn't be here today but I'm glad you were able to uh, pick up some of their stuff and, and find a way to work it in there. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, I don't know if it's a real question, but I'm going to ask it. In your social media speak, what do you think of the tendency to jokingly say the COVID vaccine gave one X-Men powers? Fun or harmful? <laughs> um, I, I would tend to think fun, but uh, then again, I'm not one of these people who gets uh, as worried as I probably should be about um, how things get misused in social media. I'm not a big social media person myself, so uh, I think I'm probably a little naive to the, the dangers of misinformation on social media. <laughs> um, anyone wants to follow me, you can, but you'll see I don't even really tweet that much. Only like if I have a book coming out, will I start tweeting again. Well, that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, I don't think it makes us any better people, if you, if you want my opinion on it. I think social media is one of the worst things that we've come up with lately. <laughs> uh, if anybody has any more questions, go ahead and put them in the chat right now. But yeah, like I said, I mean, you, um, you said at the beginning, I mean, you were um, not exactly steeped in X-Men lore before all this, and, and there's a lot of it. So um, I personally think it's very admirable that um, you, you've taken this upon yourself to... Um, bridge the gap to uh, people who might not be reached otherwise. Well, thank you. And I appreciate doing it. And you're right. I um, was only sort of casually aware of the X-Men and, and, and the more famous sort of stuff, but it was been, it's been fun digging into it a lot further. And um, so where else can we see your stuff? Um, that's a good question. So I, I run the Human Evolution blog. So if you just Google Human Evolution blog, I run that. I haven't written much lately. Uh, basically, COVID derailed a lot of stuff for me, but I'm hopefully going to be back on it soon. Uh, I am on Twitter. If you're Nathan Lentz, I think I'm, you know, the only one or the one of the only ones with that name. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm on uh, my own blog. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy to reach. If you Google me, you'll find me. And I generally respond to any emails that are nice. I, I get a lot of emails that aren't nice, and I tend yeah. not to respond to those. But <laughs> Well, we should, nice, say, so. we should say, we should say, because... You um you had an article I think it might have been the cover story in an uh, an issue of Skeptic magazine I can't I don't know the issue number offhand but uh, it was probably to me and I've read a lot of this stuff obviously the um, most accessible uh, refutation of creationism's complaints about evolution that I've ever seen. So, Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, you're correct. It was in the um, 2019, early 2019. It, it, it was a cover story of uh, Skeptic Magazine where we, me, I mean, I, I got the um, authorship of the article, but it's really a big team effort in debunking uh, intelligent design. And I tried to give credit where credit was due throughout the article because there was a lot of us that are working uh, to do this uh, just in our free time. I mean, the thing is, is that none of us get, get paid or get any kind of funding to rebut creationism we have to sort of take time out of our regular day our regular weeks to do this but it, and it just shows how much we care about the proper teaching of evolution and the proper teaching of science um because the infection uh the contagious infection of uh pseudoscience is very harmful i mean it does a lot of damage um to public confidence in science and we see that now with uh vaccine hesitance 
um, where, I mean, there's some reasonable reasons to have concerns and hesitancy about vaccines, but that's not what's driving the low vaccination rates. It, most of it is completely unreasonable and pseudoscientific. And so, um, you know, the public defense of proper science, uh, you know, lives are at stake. And, and you might think that evolution education is, uh, you know, sort of academic issue. It's really, you know, esoteric, doesn't matter in daily lives, but it's part of a larger problem which is public mistrust of science um, that really is based on um, politics. It's not really based on, on science. Or, or, uh, so um, I'm happy to be part of that effort. I was drafted into it somewhat uh, involuntarily. That's why I use the word drafted. Um, but uh, it's, been, it's been fun. I've really appreciated the experience and I've made a lot of good friends around the country for those of us who, uh, who, are, who are in this fight. And I look forward to uh, you know, the next step. Yeah, well, thank you, Nathan. I'm sure uh, I'm sure we'll be doing stuff in the future too. So, I look forward to it.